Good morning and welcome to A Life Change. This is Eileen Hicks, and I'm so very thankful that you have chosen to join me this morning. It is November 12th, 2023. We're in the middle of a sermon series about telling everybody about Jesus and that we have um, been not only chosen by God, but but given the um, marching orders to go out and share His good news with everyone. And so we've gone through a few of them, but let's pray as we get started, and then I'll remind you where we are, and then we'll go to where we are for today. Uh, Lord Jesus, we, uh, we lift up to you ourselves. We thank you and praise you uh, for what you have in store for us today. So, Lord, as we um, listen to your words, as we sit in your presence, Lord, help us to understand and grow more and more in your uh, likeness, in your uh, giftedness, that we would follow the will and the way that you have for our lives, and that we would share your good news. It is in your son's precious name. Amen. So, we've been uh, doing this sermon series um, um, of telling, we need to tell everybody. So, the first week is everybody tells somebody. And so we used Matthew 28, 16, and amidst our own experiences with evangelism and many doubts that we carry, we have to remember and realize, oh my gosh, where am I? Okay. We have to remember and realize that Christ inspires and calls us to a life of faith sharing with the assurance that he's going to go with us in that. And I think that's an important piece to, to understand is how uh, God is going to go with us in all of these things. Because I I think sometimes we feel rather alone in it. We think we're going out there, and what if somebody doesn't like us? What if somebody isn't happy with what we're going to tell them? What if somebody, you know, what what if, what if, what if, the crazies in in the world? Not those crazies, but the crazies for us when we say that to ourselves. Uh, Week two, we talked about that the good news is for everybody. The unstoppable power of the gospel of Jesus Christ breaks down barriers so that all might know the transformative love of God. So we have to know that sometimes we have a difficult time in our faith walk and we needed somebody to come alongside, somebody to tell us and minister to us that we wouldn't have otherwise known the good news of Jesus. And I shared how people came alongside me. Week three, we talked about the fact that we meet people where they are. Okay. Paul shows us that sharing often starts with learning and listening. Understanding each other can be the basis for sharing and hearing the gospel. And so it's much like I've always said when we're on this program I've said it in church, I've said it anytime anybody's ever had a conversation with me about this, is the reality is, reality is that God wants us to share our faith. And so he isn't going to not be with us while we're doing it. But, 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 we have to understand and listen the person the person that we're talking to. We need to know where they are. We need to be able to love and care for them. We can't um, tell somebody what we care about until they know we care. And so it is about a relationship that we build with somebody. And it's through that relationship that we're able to share our faith with somebody else. So I think that one's a kind of fun one. So week four of this was the world needs the good news. Uh <sighs> God loves each of us just the way we are. And through Christ, we are forgiven and offered a life of salvation. What a gift that we get to share the good news with others. And the world does need the good news. Um, Think of all the things that are going on in the world. Um, It's a dark time. And what is the light? Jesus is the light of the world that has come into the world that uh, we might um, be set free. Um, we might be set free. And so today we're going to talk about um, telling somebody with the love, with the life of love. And we often feel that sharing the gospel can only be done through our words. However, every day we can live out what we believe to encourage others to experience the loving grace that's found in the gospel. Now, I have I have to admit, um, many of you who have met me uh know what I look like. And um, so I have surprised more than one or two or five or 25 people that I'm a pastor. Uh, A couple of things are that I don't, I guess, 
um, look like what people think a pastor should or does look like. Um, not that I'm I'm not tall or not skinny or not any of those kind of things. That's not what it is. I think they have a perception of what clergy looks like. And, and specifically what the c- clergy uniform looks like. Like when you're in a hospital, it's very funny because you can usually tell who the clergy are when they're coming to visit because they're wearing uh, pretty much a polo and khakis or polo and blue pants. And, um, and they're most likely men. Not that there aren't a billion uh, incredible, uh, capable uh, women uh, who are clergy. Um, but it's just kind of funny that when you see somebody, they just assume who the clergy are. Now, the other thing I have to tell you is when I went in for one of my interviews uh, for uh, my licensing, when I was licensed, not ordained, um, I was told that I didn't have the pastoral persona to be a pastor. I didn't look like a pastor. I didn't act like a pastor. I didn't talk like a pastor. Now, I want you to know that when I brought that information back to the congregation in which I serve, they all felt that that answer was completely wrong, a thousand percent wrong, a billion percent wrong, because uh, they've experienced my words and my actions to be exactly what they expect and want from somebody who is um, part of their um, pastoral staff. So I, um, out of some fun, uh, bought some t-shirts in the last year, and I want you to know that I've gotten some um, uh, different looks, and I've gotten some interesting comments from them. Uh, one of them says, I'm a pastor, don't look so surprised. And it's just kind of a funny one, and, and all of them were meant to be funny, um, but I have had people say, really? And I'd said, yes. Um, and, and it's funny because they didn't expect at Walmart that I was a pastor. I don't know why. I just, that. Another one of the t-shirts that I bought said, I preach like a girl. Now, I want you to know that's one of my favorite t-shirts ever. Because um, back in the uh, 90s, when people were talking about, um, I, you know, a girl, you know, like she can't do it because she's a girl. Uh, they came out with um, some of the Olympians. Um, said, I run like a girl. And then, of course, she outran many, many people. Uh, I play tennis like a girl. You know, that kind of thing is is where it comes from. And so I got this one that says, I preach like a girl. Because um, I think each and every pastor has a different flavor. There is a different way that God has empowered and made us and, and brought us into the world that we would speak and there would be people that I would reach that other people wouldn't be able to reach because um, I am different. And that is um, exactly how they meant it to be. Uh, My grandmother was 98 and a half when she was um, uh, going to be with Jesus. And she had been born in uh, 1906. And so her um, matriarch, patriarch belief system Although she knew that it was faith that saved us and faith that, that uh, brought us to heaven and, and kept us connected with Jesus, um, she, she unfortunately also believed uh, somewhere in her uh, brain, not in her heart, that she needed somebody to tell her that she had been good enough or smart enough or, or qualified enough to be um, one of God's children and live in heaven with him forever. And so I was in there with a lady from hospice, and there was a lot of conversation, and she was just a wonderful lady. Um, But one of the things that she had said was that she had come to minister to grandma, and my grandma wasn't. So I said, I want you to know, I I totally understand. I'm a woman clergy, too. I understand that that's not what she needs. And what she needed was an older man to come in and tell her she was going to be fine, that uh, she was going to be with Jesus. And a gentleman came in later and asked if he could pray with her. And one of the things he said to her in the prayer was that he would meet her on the other side, the other side of the river. And, uh, explaining, uh, and, and that's a, a common, not a common phrase, a phrase meaning on the other side in heaven, we will meet again. And um, it was beautiful because that gave her such comfort, such a, a place of, of knowledge of what was going to happen and how it was going to be. And so for me, um, it was just sweet. Uh, for the lady that I was talking to, it was frustrating because she wanted to be able to help and serve, as we all do. 
but there are people who need us to be need somebody that's like this and they need somebody who's more authoritative and they need somebody who has a different denomination and they need somebody who has a, a voice that's deeper and 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 maybe um we had a man in the choir that I thought had a voice like what I expect God to sound like and uh he was a wonderful wonderful man he was a marine uh but when he got up to read scripture I want you to know I got goosebumps every time because it felt like to me that those are the way that's the voice of God um better than Morgan Freeman. I mean, just like a deep, strong, sound, capable voice. And he never stumbled over words and he never had any of that kind of problem. So part of that was it too. So I think that each one of us needs something a little different. And that's why pastors are so different. Um, so, so I want you to know that as a clergy, I run into it all the time. Now, I don't know about you, but I wonder at some point in your life, have you had somebody surprised that you were a Christian? Now, I I want you to know that, that sometimes people immediately show fear when they find out I'm a pastor because they think they're going to be judged. They think that um, they're going to... that they're not going to live up to the expectations of what I think they should be doing. Now, I want you to know I meet people where they are, and I love people for who they are. Um, not that I don't want to introduce God to them. I do. And that's why I want to be uh, have conversation and be in relationship with people so that I can, with love and grace, share the love of Jesus and how Jesus wants to come alongside us. We've all experienced some form of hurt or sometimes judgment. Perhaps we've been embarrassed of the wounds we have. We might... Uh, understand that this is part of our journey. Barner reported that 49% of American non-Christians have a favorable view of Christianity. Okay, so 90, 49% of American non-Christians have a favorable view of Christianity. That's not quite, but half of the American adults also see no value in personally attending a church. It is because the church has lost sight sometimes of what is called to be community and growing disciples, deepening our faith, encouraging one another along the journey, while meeting people where they are and boldly welcoming them into the family of God. Uh, Luke 32 to 38 is our scripture. Um, Let us get that. So our scripture for today is um, Luke 6, 32 to 38. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. I want you to remember we're all sinners, so I don't mean to judge in that. I'm not saying that at all. But let me continue in the scripture. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend them without expecting expecting um, to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, sons and daughters of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as the Father is merciful." Um, I want you to know that was from this, the part of the scripture uh, in Luke 6, uh, 627 starts with love your enemies. And then the next one is 637 uh, is the next grouping. And, and that's about judging others. Do not judge unless, and, uh, and you will not be judged. Uh, judging is not a beautiful attribute that we as humans have. And yet uh, we continue, continue to do it. Isn't that kind of fun? Not, not fun. Okay, so, um, oops, where are we? I know I keep saying, where are we? And that's because I can't find my notes in front of me. Um, it can be argued, it can be, it can be argued that that one does not need to go to church to, or to be a Christian in order to do good things. And they would be correct, absolutely, positively correct. The perception that we found this and you need to be like us uh, can be ridiculously off-putting, particularly when trying to share your faith with others. The difference, what differences do faith and church make in relation to what, uh, in the scripture, 
loving, doing good, generosity, mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. Um, if we have, if we are actively working on growing our faith alongside a community and building relationships that center around teaching as an example of Christ together. That's the reason we come into community. And so the fact that we're actually doing love, doing good, generosity, mercy, compassion, and forgiveness, these things that we show, the fruit of the Spirit, is a part of who we are as an example of Christ. Jesus is teaching us about the challenges that we often face in loving when it's not easy. It's not always easy to love everyone. But but God is asking us to do that. It is in Scripture, and it's not um, it's not a variable. Uh, it's not love if or love when or love it. You know, try. It's love one another. It's love one another. Jesus is teaching us about the challenges we face. Okay, sometimes we struggle to be loving because of preconceived notions. They don't look like what we think they should. They don't act like what we think they should. Um, Sometimes it's differencing of opinions. Oh, my heavens. If one more person talks about political things around me, I'm going to lose a gasket. I'm going to bust a gasket. I don't know. Lose my mind. I don't know what that was. That was too put together because I want you to know that your opinion is your opinion and my opinion is my opinion and I can love you and you can love me whether we agree or not. Now, I can pray for situations. I can um, encourage. We can have great conversation about it. But I don't think that we, I don't know when we got to the point where if you didn't agree with me, you were a bad person. You were a hateful, awful person. I don't know when that came about and I don't. Uh, I don't think that's one of the best things in uh, America right now. Um, That we can't be loving to each other if we don't agree. Um, Fear of being judged. I don't want you to know me, so I'm going to to not tell the truth. I'm going to uh, do something different in front of you than I would at any other time. Sometimes that's uh, kind of how uh, Christians have gotten the bad reputation for being hypocrites is because we're one way at church and another way at work or in our community or with our kids. Um, That's a really important thing to realize that it's consistency. It's the consistency of our walk with Christ that helps other people see uh, Jesus in us Uh, and desires to get even, uh, grudges, uh, those kind of things. Um, keep you from uh, loving because of of what's going on. In a world clearly divided by many issues, it's often easier or more pleasant to surround ourselves with those who are already like us. (sighs) Already like or who are like us. So if we like them, then we want to be around them. Or if they look like us or sound like us or act like us, then we want to be around them. Um, but I think that loses some of the flavor of God's humanity, uh, God's God's humanity in the world that each and every one of us is given the opportunity to be um, called his children. But Jesus calls us to a higher standard of living that includes forgiving when it's difficult, forgiving when it's difficult and loving people, even when it makes, when they make it a challenge to love them. Uh, there are people in the world, I, I'm, I know that you know somebody, I, I know that you love, lo- know somebody that you love because of who they are, and yet you know that they dress or they act or they, they put out uh, a wall so people won't love them. Um, they try their best to not be uh, in community with others because of fear or um, hurt or disappointment or childhoods. Um, so many things make us uh, close off from the world so that we don't have to deal with some of those emotions. We don't have to um, uh, be in community with people. And so sometimes it's, um, it's hard because people make it challenging to love them. Um, also, um, radically going out of our way to care for others when no material benefit is for us. Uh, how do I love the person who is uh, sitting in the alley uh, and needs food or warmth or something? How, how do we love that person? 
okay? How do we show care and grace to someone? How do we, um, how do we uh, know that there's a family in need and then help the family in need? Being a part of a, a community, uh, we are a part of a community. I remind us of that, even though we're spread over nine counties and we meet just once a week. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't take what we learned today and use that in uh, uh, the world in front of us. We need to be able to do more. Uh, that's part of who we are going out into the world and being a community. It isn't always easy being choosing the easy option. Um, this passage points out sometimes working together uh, involves going out and loving those who the world deems unlovable. Oh, but the world isn't in charge of who's lovable. Um, We're not in charge of who's lovable. Every person that we see, every person that we interact with, every person that we spend time with is a beloved child of God. A beloved child of God. Verse 29 says, uh, Jesus says, when someone takes your coat, don't, when somebody takes your coat, don't hesitate to offer them your shirt too. There is a wisdom here where we might uh, instinctively focus on reacting to someone taking our coat. Jesus is saying, stop and see that there is a need here to be more, um, a need here to be met, an opportunity to show grace and love and forgiveness, even in the moment when something wrong has been done to us. Um, one of my favorite uh, jokes, it's not a joke, one of my favorite things that, that we say at church is, you know, we're doing something and I'm like, um, does anybody know where the Bible that was in the library was? And, no, it's not there. Well, then somebody must have needed it. And so we just get another Bible. Um, we don't focus on the fact that somebody needed a Bible. Uh, we don't look at it in any other way than somebody needed a Bible. And so uh, we want to make sure that that when we respond to things like that, we see the need and then how can we meet that need? While you may not consider yourself a judgmental person or that we are judgmental people, we likely experience judgmental thoughts and actions at times. Each and every one of us do. We have a preconceived notion of somebody else and that's a judgment. Uh, and sometimes judgments can be good. You know how the word we say consequences, that every action has a consequence? We say consequence, and we think the word consequence means bad, okay? Uh, but consequence is just the outcome of an action. Uh, there are good consequences, and there are bad consequences. There are good judgments, and there are bad judgments. And so we have to remember that we need to focus and keep the eyes and mind of Christ in front of us so that when we uh, look at somebody and make a judgment, it is a judgment in their favor. It is a judgment with love and grace and forgiveness and uh, uh, seeing them how God sees them in our heart. Rather than spending our energy on things like holding grudges, ignoring, avoiding, and getting even, what if we intentionally took time to examine ourselves? This is not to say what should uh, judge ourselves, that we should not judge ourselves, but that we should examine how we love others, how we treat others, how we react to others, how we interact with others even with difficult people. We can examine whether when people interact with us, the gospel of Jesus' love is shining through our actions and our attitudes. Uh, Francis of Assisi, I, I pull that up on my phone all the time because I think it's just a wonderful, wonderful quote. Um, it's actually uh, attributed to him, but it's that many people say it wasn't him necessarily. Um, it's very, very um, uh, popular and often attributed to Francis of Assisi. It says, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. So implicitly, what they're saying is everything we do should react and reflect and, and be the eyes and the mind and the, the heart of Christ. That what we do, um, how we love and um, 
Now, I have to say that there are people who think that that's a very bad thing. There are problems with saying that. But I want you to know that that um, when we say that, it's not that, that the things you're doing is not um, uh, reflecting Christ. It's how do you share Christ in moments, not in uh, platitudes, not in standing on a soapbox. How do you say, oh, I do that because Jesus tells me to. How, how do we respond in such a way that other people see Jesus in us? We can examine whether when people interact with us, the gospel of Jesus' love is shining through our actions and our attitudes. It's an important one. I want you to know that I don't want you to be full of self-judgment as a kind of reflection. I want you to hear the encouragement that this is a new faith or the church, uh, us as a group, could respond to this. Uh, Verse 38 says, for the measure by which you judge yourself will be the measure you use to judge others. So practicing self-kindness can help ease the judgment when we show that to others because it changes our measure. If we look in the mirror before we look at others and we say, you know what, I've fallen short. And guess what? If they've fallen short too, we are exactly the same. We've all fallen short. We've all followed short of the glory of God. And if we use that as our measuring stick, uh, as our yardstick for judgment, it will help us. It will help us to be the light and the love of Jesus in the world. Remember, John 3, 17 says Jesus was not, did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through him. So if we remember 317, not 316, which is a wonderful one too, we see that Jesus does not condemn the world. Jesus does not condemn us. And it is not our job to do that either. Our job is to watch and share and be the hands and feet of Christ in every way. Every word we utter with every action we take we know that kids are watching us. And the only, and not only our kids are watching us, but the world is watching us too. Too often, we are left wondering whether or not what we as Christians do preaches the gospel of love. It seems sometimes to be difficult, loving and refraining from judgment and forgiving. Yet Jesus calls us to be a community with one another in community with one another, that we might grow in love, grow in forgiveness, and help each other grow in grace. Lord Jesus, we uh, thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the love and grace that you have given to us. Help us be your hands, your feet, your love and grace in the world, that we might for others uh, see what you have for us. We thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, just a couple of things I want to uh, remind you of. Last week, I invited you, if you wanted to do my Bible study, you just need to call the church. It's 492-9136-937. And um, it is there at the church. Uh, It is uh, the heart that grew three sizes. It's based on the Grinch. But how we as Christians... Uh, can have our life changed by really understanding and pursuing Christmas in the way God intended us to pursue Christmas. So an important, important thing. Uh, It is $10 for the book. Uh, If you are not able to buy the book, that's okay. Just tell me and uh, somebody else will have paid for it for you. We have a couple of donations already so that um, those who are not able to will still be able to come and be a part. It's at 630. It'll probably be over... 7.30, quarter eight in that range, probably quarter eight. Uh, Yeah, probably, yeah, because there'll be some chit and chatting because that's just the way we are. I think that that would be the way, and we would just love, love, love for you to uh, join us. So many ways we would love for you to join us. Uh, So I also am doing it on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So if you don't want to drive in the dark or that's a better time for you, please uh, feel free to join either one of us. 
either one of those, I would be so excited to have you there. Uh, our church, uh, Sydney First Methodist Church downtown, is going to have five services on Christmas Eve. So I want to invite you, and if you are not connected to a church already, invite you to our regular services, which are nine, which is traditional, and 11, which is contemporary. Um, or Christmas Eve, uh, since it falls on a Sunday, we have a nine o'clock, which is traditional, and uh, 11 o'clock, which is contemporary. And then in that evening, we have a 4 p.m., which is a family service, a 7 p.m., which is contemporary. And then at 1030, we start the music. People are doing songs. And uh, at 11 o'clock, the traditional service starts. So, um, and it'll go right into midnight for silent night. All three of the four, seven and 11 have candlelight at them. And so I encourage you to be a part of that. Um, we're, uh, I'm doing some things, uh, getting ready to figure out our sermon series, get it all together for, uh, uh, Christmas. Um, we're going to prepare, we're going to prepare, uh, uh, as we, uh, get ready for the holidays, as we prepare and get ourselves ready are we prepared uh, for Jesus? Are we prepared for what is really coming? And are we preparing that uh, we would hear and do um, and not fuss about the things, but uh, change who we are for the coming of Jesus? Uh, also, I wanted to mention to you, I'm going a little late, but I think they'll be able to fix it up. Um, we have here at Hits 105.5, if you go to the website, um, you can go into the merchandise, and in there, there are t-shirts and sweatshirts that say, A Life Changed by Eileen Hicks. And so if you're interested in ordering them, I promised I would mention that on the air. So thank you to the radio station for putting that together, and thank you for uh, hosting me that I'm able to do this program uh, two times every uh at 9.30 and 10.30 each and every Sunday. So thank you for joining me. I am so blessed by that. I pray that you are, um, that you are realizing that it is also our job to share the love of Jesus with all those around us. Share his word. Share the good news. If it's not good news, if it's not good news if it's not for everybody. God bless you. My name is Eileen Hicks, and I am a life changed.